Hello. Welcome to The Money Game, where we make actionable predictions about the big story shaping the world today. My name is David Wu, a former investment strategist who has decided to make the best of Wall Street research accessible to all. If you're interested in making money, you're in the right place. If you're not, this program is the Last week, we spent a lot of time on the outlook for the U.S. in 2022. This week, I will focus on the second most important country in the world, China. I think Chinese fundamentals are set to get worse in 2022. But I will explain to you why I think this should be viewed as a positive for Chinese financial markets. I will also discuss some investment opportunities. Whether you agree or not with the Chinese approach to controlling the pandemic, there is no denying that China has managed to contain COVID more effectively than other countries. Two years into the pandemic, China has reported only 115,000 confirmed cases. As a share of its 1.4 billion people, this is just 0.08% compared to 8% in Germany and 16% in the US. Now, of course, many people don't believe in the Chinese numbers. I have a bit more faith in them, but not because I believe Beijing is committed to the truth. I just think that very large numbers will be very difficult to hide, even with censorship and propaganda. Because China has been successful in keeping COVID at bay, it's been the fastest growing economy during the COVID era. It is estimated to have grown 8% in 2021. Among the largest economy in the world, only India would have grown faster, but this is only because the Indian economy was clubbered in 2020. Despite the brisk economic expansion, China has so far avoided the inflation problem that has come to plague so many other countries in 2021. Its core consumer price inflation, excluding food and energy, is barely above 1% compared to 5% in the US and nearly 9% in Russia. Against this backdrop, it is perhaps not a surprise to you that the Chinese currency RMB was the strongest major currency in 2021. It rose nearly 3% against the US dollar in a year that will be remembered by traders for the dollar's appreciation against 90% of major currencies. With everything I've told you so far, you might think that the Chinese stock market probably had a decent year too. Yet, believe it or not, the Chinese stock market was the worst performing stock market in 2021. It fell by a whopping 23%. The Chinese stock market did even worse than Brazil that was hit by a combination of another recession and double-digit inflation at the same time. 2021 was so bad for the Chinese stock market that it was the worst year in terms of the absolute return for the Chinese stock market in 10 years. But even more shocking was the magnitude of the relative returns of the Chinese stock market. With the global stock market going up by 20%, the Chinese stock market underperformed the world stock market by 40 percentage points. This is the greatest underperformance by the Chinese stock market since China joined the World Trade Organization 20 years ago. A 40 percentage point underperformance is not only unprecedented for China, but it is extremely rare for any country. Indeed, over the last 20 years, this magnitude of underperformance has only happened to one other country, Russia, after Moscow, decided to invade Ukraine in 2014. For whatever it's worth, history indicates that such massive underperformance is likely to be followed by outperformance in the subsequent year. For example, the Russian stock market beat the world stock market by nearly 7% in 2015. So, are we to put our trust in history and start buying Chinese stocks hand over fist? Or shall we assume that this time things will be different? To arrive at a conclusion, we need to understand why the Chinese stock market performed so miserably in 2021. One of the most important economic theories is that of economic convergence. The theory begins with the assumption that rich countries are rich only because their workers are more productive. They're more productive because they work with more capital. Think of capital as computers. You don't have to be an economist to see that the more computers there are in a country, the more productive the workers in that country are going to be. 
The convergence theory says that for poor countries to catch up to rich countries, they need to invest more capital than rich countries in order to eventually reach the same capital labor ratio. Over the past 20 years, China, a middle income country, has been by far the fastest growing economy in the world. This is because China has been investing more aggressively than everybody else. Indeed, investment as a share of Chinese GDP is 42%, the highest in the world. To put the number in perspective, China invests 30% more than South Korea, 100% more than the US, and 130% more than Brazil. Before the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, much of Chinese investment went into manufacturing and infrastructure that turned China into the workshop of the world. During the financial crisis, Chinese exports collapsed and subsequently never managed to recover to the pre-crisis level of export growth of 20-30% a year. Faced with this reality, Beijing decided to promote housing investment. The idea was that this would, on the one hand, facilitate a faster urbanization of Chinese rural population, and on the other, will help usher in the age of Chinese consumers, and so reducing China's dependence on foreign demand. And so Beijing began to direct credit flows to the real estate sector. In less than 10 years, real estate loans as a share of GDP more than doubled to reach 50%. Of course, the result was a huge housing bubble. Property prices rose so much over the past 10 years that a 100 square meter apartment now costs about the same in Shanghai as in Tokyo, even though per capita income in Japan is still four times higher than that of China. The housing bubble created numerous problems. It turned into a political hot potato for the Chinese leadership with the collapse of the fertility rate of the past three years, as it is these days commonly attributed to the high cost of housing. At the beginning of 2021, Xi Jinping decided that enough was enough. He decided to burst the housing bubble before it got any bigger. In response to tighter credit conditions and new prudential regulations, housing starts contracted by more than 20% over the past three months alone versus a year ago. Chinese property developers became headline news globally, as many of them are now teetering on the verge of default. If despite that desperate housing situation, the Chinese economy still managed to grow 8% in 2021, it was only because of the unintended consequences of Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion fiscal extravaganza that was passed in March 2021. That stimulus boosted U.S. household spending and indirectly Chinese exports. No wonder some people are thinking that Chinese are snatching up Hunter Biden's paintings at half a million dollars apiece. So what is China's outlook in 2022? In my view, things are going to get worse. However, I do think that bad news for China may be good news for Chinese markets. First of all, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia has seen to it that there won't be another major fiscal stimulus package in 2022. This means that demand for Chinese goods from the U.S. is unlikely to sustain the 20% plus growth in 2021. Secondly, Omicron is set to put China's zero tolerance policy to a serious test. The seven day average of new confirmed COVID cases in China hit 240 on January 1st. This is the highest reading since the early days of the pandemic. Indeed, Omicron could turn the Beijing Winter Olympic next month into a full blown public health crisis. The sad reality is that nobody will be sorry if China falls flat on her face. It is human nature that when we're suffering that we want to see our neighbors suffer too. I'm not passing any moral judgment, I'm just stating a fact. What's happening in Xi'an, the city of 13 million people, does not go well for the Olympics. It's been 10 days since the city has been placed under complete lockdown, and so far the extreme measures have not managed to reduce the rate of new infections. There have been no official confirmation about the identity of the variant, 
but it seems reasonable to think it is Omicron given its high level of contagiousness. You may recall that I've been saying for the past month that Omicron is likely to be the light at the end of the tunnel for the world. That is contagiousness combined with mild symptoms might allow the world to reach herd immunity quickly and safely. I wish I could say that about China too, but I won't. If only because China's zero tolerance policy has served it so well up until now that it's unlikely Beijing will give it up easily. Moreover, a new study out of Hong Kong shows that three doses of China's vaccines against COVID do not produce adequate level of antibodies against Omicron. This could further strengthen Beijing's incentive to stay with the zero tolerance policy. What this means, of course, is that the Omicron may end up having basically a more negative impact on the Chinese economy than elsewhere. Meanwhile, the election of the National People's Congress, which takes place every five years, will be held in late 2022. The election is important symbolically because the new NPC will go on in 2023 to elect the next president. The Chinese stock market has tended to do well in election years, as China's leadership has a good reason to want to paint a rosy picture for the future to justify its legitimacy. For these reasons, and to fight the economic headwinds, I think Beijing has no choice but to cut interest rates in 2022. And with interest rates above the rate of inflation, China has plenty of scope to do so. I am bullish Chinese government bonds across the entire yield curve. I, start, I especially like them as they also provide a nice hedge against my short U.S. government bond positions, if you recall. A couple of ETFs make it pretty easy for non-institutional players like me to gain exposure. CNYB listed in Europe and 2829 Hong Kong listed in Hong Kong both offer a convenient way to express a direction of view on this market. In parallel, I see China also easing credit constraints further in order to boost loan growth. Low interest rates and easier credit conditions ought to be bullish for Chinese stocks. I'm going to start building a long position in KWEB, an ETF linked to Chinese internet stocks that's down 70% from the peak. I'm mindful, though, that I don't want to catch a falling knife, and therefore I plan to build this position very, 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 very slowly, one step at a time. Before we wrap it up, let's take a look at my honest board. You know, as I told you last week, I bought Disney at the open on Monday, $152 a share, CCL at 2025, and TBF at $16. With Disney, I've achieved 100% of my intended position, while for CCL and TBF, I still have room to add. Tomorrow, I would buy the first 10% of my intended position for KWEB and 100% of the intended position for CNYB. On that note, talk to you next week.